And so now we're going to welcome to the stage a world-renowned magician, Mr. Kevin Spencer. Kevin? You've got hands already. I'm telling you. Howdy. It's a real honor for me to be here and to have this opportunity to talk with all of you guys. I have to tell you, as I started to think about what I wanted to share, I realized I could never fit it all into 15 minutes, so I hope I've chosen wisely. Um, probably a good place for me to start is with a brief introduction of who I am, what I do, how I ended up here. Uh, my name is Kevin Spencer, and my world into this, or my path into this world of rehabilitation and disability awareness and advocacy has had a few twists and turns along the way. I'm an artist. My wife and I have performed internationally with one of the largest and most theatrical touring illusion productions in the world. That means almost every night somewhere on the planet, I have the opportunity to take my audiences on a journey to the brink of impossibility. And sometimes I bring them back. The, not always. The art of illusion has a story as old as recorded history. It's probably the oldest and most universal of all of the performing arts because it so easily translates from one culture to another. In earlier times, magicians were called the scientists of show business, daring, adventurous, willing to take on new impossibilities with no guarantees of success. Honestly, can you imagine the first magician who decided to cut a woman in half? Honey, get in the box. <laughs> My wife would never go for that. Magicians were very much the outside-of-the-box thinkers of their day. I think sometimes when we think about magic, we think of it kind of like a comic book, where a guy in a cape twirls his mustache, throws his hand, says a magic word, and there's this giant puff of smoke and something magical happens on the stage, which is why I'm standing here without a cape or a mustache or smoke machines, though that would be really cool. Those of us who grew up in magic, we, we understand what it's all about. It's the lure of knowing a secret, having a special talent, being able to attract an audience and tell a story and offer them something exotic and interesting, like this little box. When I was a kid, Every magic trick looks sort of like this, a fancy painted box. And when we wanted to make it really special, really magical, we'd put a dragon on the side. Or we'd paint Chinese characters all over it. Because that meant it came from someplace far, far away and had special magical powers. I wanted to show you this little box because it reminds me of a lot of the people with disabilities I've come to know. The ones who've been placed inside the box by the people around them. The ones that don't quite fit in because society has already decided the size and the shape of the box so that we all fit so nice and neatly on the same size shelf. Of course, those of us who work with individuals with disabilities understand that problem. As long as we keep defining the box, we'll only get certain things to fit inside. I think over the last few years, we've been changing our point of view. What exactly is the box? Who exactly is supposed to fit inside? Well, maybe we've had it backwards, twisted, upside down. Maybe it's not about the people at all, but our perspective that changes everything. Sometimes. It takes something just that simple to get you to look at things in a completely different way. And now, maybe you understand the appeal of magic and why some kids, even big kids like me, find these mysteries to be exotic and interesting. Special and magical. I have learned to look beyond the box, to ignore the obvious container. But I've also learned that sometimes teaching a few simple little magic tricks to someone with a disability can completely change their perspective, break away the box that surrounds them, giving them an entirely new set of skills and understandings. Those of us who work in magic have, know that there's this process, a procedure to learning a new magic trick. My friend and mentor was a great magician named Doug Henning. Doug had a very specific 
formula for learning a magic trick that I think speaks loudly to those of us who work in the disability community. He would say this, the difficult must become habit. The habit becomes beautiful. Beautiful becomes magic. I think the one thing that most people start to think about when they see a magician, especially in a symposium or a forum like this, is so how in the world does a magician get involved in rehab in the first place? Or what does a magician have to do with disability awareness or advocacy? Arts advocates often talk about the power of the arts, about their ability to transform and inspire and challenge and build community. And as an artist, I believe the arts do have the ability to make an impact in, and, and make a difference in the areas in which we live, learn, work, and heal. That conviction was confirmed very early for me in my magic career when I was involved in a really bad car accident. The car I was in was crushed by a tractor trailer. I woke up in neurological intensive care with a closed brain injury and a lower spinal cord injury. I spent the next several months in rehabilitation working very, very hard to regain all the skills that I'd lost as a result of that accident. That process was long, it was frustrating, but mostly it was boring. And that was a hard part. It was very, very difficult sometimes for me to get up the motivation that was necessary to reach some of those very important therapeutic goals. Fortunately, I had some really awesome therapists who encouraged me and motivated me, and I came out on the very good side of it and, and realized a full recovery. But when it was all over, I remember walking into the office of the director of rehabilitation and saying, there's got to be a better way to do this. Now, I have since learned that that is not the way you talk to professionals in the field. <laughs> but at the time, I could blame it on the fact that I had a brain injury. So they cut me a little bit of slack. I am a firm believer that everything happens for a reason. And as a result of that experience, I've collaborated with a number of therapists to develop a treatment program that uses simple little magic tricks as a fun and motivating way for clients to reach therapeutic goals and to improve cognitive and motor skills. And so we began exploring the idea of how we might use magic tricks in a different setting in the hospital to provide them as an adjunct to some of the more tra uh, traditional treatment techniques. The first group that we worked with were stroke clients. Uh, there seemed to be an abundance of stroke clients that summer at my particular hospital. Uh, strokes may require 20 to 24 weeks of a traditional form of therapy. What we found when we started to integrate simple little magic tricks into this process is that these clients were reaching pretty significant markers at 10 weeks, 11 weeks, 12 weeks. And at that point, we had to ask ourselves why. Well, because they were actually motivated to do their magic. They were motivated to do their therapy. If you're a grandparent and you know your grandkids are coming to visit you, what would you rather say to them? Hey, watch grandpa put these pegs in a board or let grandpa show you a magic trick. So there was a huge difference. The motivation made a big difference. As therapists began to see the results that these clients were having, we started to expand within our hospital and then to other facilities to include accidents, spinal cord injuries, head injuries, and even into the psych ward, which was really, really interesting. This continued enthusiasm by therapists led to a feature article in the Journal of the American Medical Association, the invitation to speak at several state therapy conferences, and a live national teleconference that was broadcast in all 50 states from Alaska to Florida. Since that time, I've developed a very specific protocol of therapeutic magic tricks and have been working closely with academic and medical researchers around the world to underpin this work with robust scientific research. Field work on magic trick integration with traumatic brain injury won first poster prize at the Canadian Association of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation in Toronto. Field work on using magic tricks in mental health won first poster prize at the International Mental Health Conference in Hong Kong. And one of my favorites, research on using magic tricks as a themed approach in hand-arm bimanual intensive therapy for children with hemoplegia won first poster prize at the European Academy of Childhood Disabilities. And the abstract was accepted for publication in developmental medicine and child neurology. We've also published papers in the journals of hand therapy and the International Association of Special Education. 
based on a tremendous amount of research. The American Occupational Therapy Association has endorsed the use of magic tricks as an authentic method of achieving therapeutic goals. Gotta tell you, as a magician, I thought that was pretty cool. And today, the concepts of magic therapy are being used in more than 2,000 hospitals and rehab centers in more than 30 countries around the world. A few months ago, I produced a short documentary called Powerful Medicine, Simply Magic. It gives voice to some incredible individuals with disabilities and how using magic as a part of their therapy program had significant impact in their lives. I'd like to introduce you to one of the young guys who's featured in this film. His name is Tristan. He's a young boy from the United Kingdom with hemoplegia. Yeah, they always say, like, why do you have a broken hand? They always say that. I don't have a broken hand, do I? It's just hemiplegia, isn't it? Welcome to the magic show. I am going to make the ball drop through the cup. As an artist, I think it's remarkable that what I do to entertain people also has the ability to impact the quality of somebody's life. This type of treatment program empowers therapists with a valuable new tool to motivate their clients to become more involved in their treatment program, teaching them to do something that the normal able-bodied person can't do. A magic trick can be such a tremendous boost to their self-esteem and self-worth. I worked with medical students yesterday. Many of them looked just like that <laughs> when they learned this magic trick. Teaching them to learn a magic trick can be a tremendous boost to their self-esteem and, and can really be a tremendous boost to the self-esteem of anyone with a disability, a debilitating injury, or an illness, and it can motivate them in so many other areas of their life. In addition to increasing the motivational levels, there's this reshaping of their self-concept, which is such a critical part of the rehabilitation and the recovery of a client. Empowering clients to feel good about themselves and their accomplishments can motivate them to try harder, to take more risks, and to encourage them to continue to build their self-confidence while improving cognitive and psychomotor skills. The repetitive actions of performing a magic trick can build strength and dexterity, and that can lead to increased independence. And the performance skills that are taught as a part of the magical learning experience are used to increase the participants' communication skills, confidence, self-esteem, and emotional well-being. Here's what we know. Magic tricks work in three very important areas. It's about dexterity. You have to be able to manipulate the props in order, ah, it's not gonna come up there, sorry. You have to be able to manipulate the props in order to do the trick. The second thing that we know it works on is in motivation. When you explain to a client that practice is an important part of, of being successful with the magic trick, they know what that means. And because they're learning something that the normal person can't do, it's a tremendous motivator. And then third and most important in my mind is the social aspect of magic. Magic doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's not a magic trick until you perform it for somebody and they go, how did you do that? Otherwise, it's just a series of moves. So we know that it works in those three areas. As a person learns to perform a magic trick, they voluntarily spend much more time working to acquire a complex and sequential series of motor skills. In more traditional forms of therapy, they might simply tolerate those activities rather than become completely engaged in them. But most importantly, the skills that you learn by performing a simple little magic trick can be transferred over to activities of daily living. Children especially need to be taught the, to recognize their abilities to do more than they might realize. The more they believe in those abilities, the more apt they are to attempt new things and become successful in those endeavors. The main, the main limitation on what individuals can do is what they think they can't do. 
Sometimes, my most memorable moments have happened in those places where we didn't have the highest expectations. Take a look at this guy. He completely rose to the occasion, mastered this magic trick, and that's what magic is all about. In our society, we talk a great deal about diversity and equity and inclusion. But I think sometimes we've lost sight of what those words mean when we talk about people who have abilities that are different than our own. As a magician, I am a master of reality and illusion. It is my job to make things appear differently than they might seem. But that shouldn't be true for people with disabilities. Far too often we think that they're not anything like us, but they are. They have the same hopes and dreams just like you and I. But their futures are so often molded by the attitudes and perceptions that we have about who they are and what they're capable of. As a global society, it's time for us to start appreciating what they can do and stop focusing on what we believe they can't do. Sometimes those of us in the arts, some of those in the health professions, forget the role the arts can play in promoting and protecting human health. But the arts are not just an essential part of our society. They are a critical part of the way that we heal. Magic wands don't always belong with black cats and rabbits. Sometimes they belong in hospitals where frail hands learn tricks and the magic the real magic is in the healing. Thank you. So, Kevin, my, my phone is blowing up here. Uh -oh. we, we have a bunch of messages. Uh, let, uh, several in, along the same line. Uh, this is Mike C. from Albion College. Would you say that the methods that PTs and OTs and other rehab specialists use should begin to incorporate magic or arts uh, to patients um, that are not associated with mental disabilities such as broken limbs or torn ligaments to reach motivated goals? I absolutely think it's a very powerful motivator. I know that in my own process of rehab, uh, the point of, of not doing purposeful activity, mm. when a physical therapist or an occupational therapist has you do specific exercises and you don't understand what that's supposed to accomplish, you're not really motivated to do some of those things. Right. But when you're learning a magic trick because there's an end game mm. to it, you know at the end you're gonna be able to perform this trick, I think it becomes much more motivating for the client to be able to work on that. Cool. Um, Haley M. from Cornell, if you were trying to do this for yourself, how do you get the motivation to even start the magic trick? Do you always need an enabler in order to increase your chances of recovery? Wow, that's a good question. I think for me, because I was a magician before my accident, um, the motive, that was my world, that's where I lived. And so I had really an intrinsic motivation to, to do the magic. I think what we find when I work with clients with disabilities is that you, you have to demonstrate the trick for them first mm -hmm. so they can understand that it's not supposed to happen. And then that curiosity kind of takes over, and the curiosity becomes the enabler rather than the person becoming the enabler. Right. So how to, how to make it work, huh? Right. Yeah. So uh, this is Christina from here in the auditorium. My mom is an OT, occupational therapist, and focuses mainly on youth with physical and cognitive disabilities. Is this something that she could use with children who have cognitive cognitive disabilities such as Down syndrome or even with children who struggle with less severe dis disabilities such as dyslexia? Absolutely. We actually have two different programs. Our health care side is called Healing of Magic. The educational side of what we do is called Hocus Focus. Mm. And it's a program that works in school systems with children with a learning disability classification. We do a tremendous amount of work with Down syndrome, with kids on the autism spectrum, children with emotional behavior disorders. And it's a really well-structured program. We spent the last 18 months psychometrically validating an assessment tool for teachers and therapists that actually measures client growth in five dimensions, in cognition, motor skills, creativity and adaptability, oral expression and social skills mm -hmm. development using an arts integrated intervention. For me, it's all kind of centered around magic, but we know empirically, we know that it actually helps those students to learn better and to improve some of the skills they find challenging. Yeah, super, congratulations thank on all you, of that. Thank you, sir. Please join me in thanking Mr. Spencer for being with us. Thank you. For this job. Thank you.